How you doing people? You know, I wasn't really going with that notion that Eros Benz Jr. had lingering effects from the car accident. Post-fight critics have talked about how Eros Benz Jr. has regressed in a speech pattern and essentially has gone into the fight impaired. A lot of the credit is taken away of Terence Crawford, who is the man who inflicted the damage that eventually had Eros Benz look in the way he did. I don't remember earlier fights in which uh, we have um, raised these red flags. I think he has stepped up in level and his flaws have been exposed. He was bullied in the clinches, not being maybe the inside fighter he was proclaimed to be. Terence Crawford was able to hand fight in the clinches and be defensively very responsible and make his punches count when he didn't necessarily have the highest work rate but he had a very consistent jab and I feel like that weapon is very underestimated and high class fighter can be made to look less than keep you resetting, keep you confused, keep you hesitant, keep you shell-shocked, which is what Errol Spence became in that fight, anticipating, you know, trying to feign aggression, show that he was the boogeyman, you know what I mean, live up to his reputation, walking him down, trying to work the body, he was trying, you know, he wasn't landing though, he wasn't landing to the body as he'd like to, Terence Crawford was very defensively responsible on the inside, you see him switch up like a Floyd Mayweather from high guard to a shoulder roll and he's doing it from the southpaw position, we've seen Pauli Spadafora use the shoulder roll in that stance, might also be a little bit of Errol Spence having trouble with a slick southpaw, simple as that. Counter punching southpaw. How many fighters has um, Juan Manuel Marquez made to look very foolish, although they were solid yeah. fighters? It's that counter-punching style, man, and uh, Crawford put on a clinic when it comes to counter-punching. Harold Spence Jr. has a tendency, this shell-shocked anticipating of often getting hit and then he's bending at his waist, kind of exposing one side of his head, you know what I mean? Crawford, he'll put that left hand behind your ear and he has no problem doing that, no qualms. Just ask Henry Lundy, it almost looks illegal. These are Bud Spencer knockdowns, these are into the canvas drilling knockdowns. You know, he did it to Gamboa, he did it to Hank Lundy. He'll throw downwards trajectory nuclear punches. They end up being nuclear, might not be Adonis Stevenson, but Superman used to do it. Try to nail you into the canvas, landing on the neck, behind the ear, back of the head. The brainstem rupturers. 
a lot of people talk about how Ali has been done in by by those type of punches or a James Tone, you know, all that rolling, exposing the back of the head, giving up back of the head punches, have you fucked up and slurring later on. And Spence has a tendency of doing that, and he was getting tagged to the back of the head and cleaned up with the right hook. When it comes to like dude having brain damage, he has that southern drawl. Drawl. <laughs> Shout out to Brendan Sharp. Brendan! But he has that lean, that lean vibe going, you know what I mean? And I always said that. We just attribute it to him having no personality back in the day, you know? It wasn't brain damage at that point. Then again, he had a lazy eye. That lazy eye could be attributed to some brain functions misfiring. Yeah, nitpicking. I think this dude, man, got tagged to the back of the head. Got hit with a stiff jolt, you know, to the neck. Left hand, right jab. And the corner of Crawford was calling for the one-to-one. -one. Wanted him to, to end these combinations with a jab, you know, and make the jab count. That's the old Jack Dempsey technique, man, the jolt. To maintain its equilibrium, your rescuing right foot acted as a springboard. The left foot serves as a trigger to spring the right foot. So the falling step sometimes is called the trigger step. I warned, don't make a preliminary movement before stepping off. Had you followed your natural inclination and shifted your weight to the right foot before stepping, that action would have started your body weight moving backward, away from the direction in which you intended to step. Then, you would have had to lose a split second while your right foot was stopping the backward motion and shifting your weight forward again before the punching step could be taken. Learn now and always remember that in fighting you cannot afford to give your body the luxury of a useless preliminary or preparatory movement before shooting a punch. In the first place, your target may be open for only a split second. And you must take advantage of that opening, like a bolt of lightning. Secondly, preliminary movements are giveaways, tell tales, telegraphs that treacherously betray to your opponent your own next action. You now know how to set your weight into motion for a straight jolt by means of the falling step. So of course I'm rooting for Pacquiao to win because that's a bigger fight. But after watching the fight again, I was like, they not saying nothing about all them shots Jeff Horn was hitting Pacquiao with. And he mm. was just brutally bullying them, roughing them up. Uh, they could say, oh, he was being dirty. Sometimes he a headbutt, but it's a fight. That's mm. going to happen. You know, but he was real life manhandling Pacquiao, like pushing them all around. And you see Keith Thurman couldn't even do that. Yeah. You know, and it's, seeing him beat Keith Thurman at 40 years old, like, God damn, this guy's great. I mean, right. just look at his career with eight different weight classes, world titles eight. in mm -hmm. eight, eight different weight classes. Forty years old beats Keith Thurman, who's in his prime. Right, crazy. He sure turned back the hands of time on that one. It's it, fucking it, crazy, didn't he? And he fought in spurts. Both of them yeah. fought in spurts. And I thought Keith was gonna pick up on it, but Pacquiao was only fighting, fighting the end of the round. Like mm -hmm. Keith would come on strong at the beginning of the round. And they would be like, all right, Keith winning, winning this round. And then Pacquiao would just be like, Trip. Yeah. pop, 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 pop. And then Keith would be like, <laughs> like, oh, man. I didn't even see the fight. Well, when he dropped him with that right hook early in the first, you're like, oh, It's like a right shit. Yeah. Boom, 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 like, boom. No, it was like a, he jumped in with the left and then followed by like a straight right. It's crazy. Yeah. Explosive and quick with his right hand and he is left handed. Right. But that little right jab, yeah. he he put it he put him down in the first round with yeah. a little quick flick right. Mm -hmm. It's actually a jab. It's a hard jab. 
A hard jab knocked him down. Knocked him down. Unbelievable. A simple, hard right jab. No preliminary movement. Just lift the left foot and let the body fall forward in a long, quick step. The left foot should land flat and solid on the floor at the end of the step. It is a quick, convulsive, and extremely awkward step. Yes, it's one of the most important steps of your fistic life, for that falling forward lurch is the rough diamond out of which will be ground the beautiful straight knockout jolt. It's the gem movement of straight punching. Try that falling step many times. Make certain each time that you start from a comfortably balanced position, that the body weight is resting largely on the left leg and the knees are slightly bent, that the arms are at your side and that you make no preliminary movement with the right foot. I call that forward lurch a falling step. Actually, every step in walking involves a small fall. Walking is a series of falls, but in this particular step, the fall is exaggerated for two reasons. One, your weight is well forward when you step off. And two, the step is so long, it gives gravity a chance to impart unusual momentum to your body weight. The solidity with which your left foot landed upon the floor was caused by your momentum. It was crazy. It's like, wow. It but that's over the plans. shoulder. Yep. yep. That's his plans. Yep. They were showing him hitting other fighters with it. The same mm -hmm. thing. Well, boom, boom. He has such a unique style. <laughs> the leaping what, in, what, what firing What would you have done if he came in with that shit on you? I check. <laughs> boom, boom. <laughs> 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 oh man. Brenton Rios had that also in his repertoire. The all Cameron Duncan connection. But Eric couldn't do anything with it, man. And he was getting hit to the back of the head and to the neck. That shit will discombobulate you and also negate like any type of plan that you might have had, you know? Your thought process getting constantly interrupted, man. That's what a jab will do to you. And imagine also like equilibrium punches, man. They will linger, they will stay with you. Just ask. Anthony Joshua in the Andy Ruiz fight, you know? These punches aren't easy to recover from, although you're not necessarily like out of it. It's just like your legs might be gone. Like Mickey Ward, Arturo Gatti in the second fight. Your balance is shot, basically. Look at Spence walking back after the first round, you know? Back to his corner after the knockdown. He got up and he was fighting. He was fighting hard. Even in the beginning of the second round, he was fighting hard. But, uh,. I think he was just fighting through the hurt, you know what I mean? His legs were gone, but he was determined. Always funny like to see fighters have a goofy smile on their face, you know, while they're getting hurt. Thomas Hearns, Marvin Hagler. Thomas Hearns, like after the first round, he has this goofy smile on his face. Like they know what's coming, trying to put on a brave face. Let's look at this, man. I think this is the round. This is where like his face gets busted. Like also Crawford had this Zab Judah uppercut on luck and Earl Spence Jr. was getting whipped with the luck. His jabs sound like fucking whips. He makes a shit count man, you see damage. Earl Spence Jr. has like this heavy handed big guy punching, you know what I mean? Trying to punch at a big target. That's what he's trying to do, you know what I mean? Hoping like that you find yourself in front of his fist. George Foreman stuff. Crawford is slippery and sharp and devastating what he's hitting you know what i mean like he's cutting and bruising like aerospins jr looked like he had prosthetics after the fight like his eyes the shit under his eyes whatever that was man anyways let's get into this let's see the the nuclear exploding at the at the brainstem a clever left hook not a left hook the jolt again two jolts he's trying to power to just got checked again with a jolt. Ooh, see, that's what I'm saying. There it was. Spence overshoots his range with a jab and misses. Oh no, he actually landed that. He landed his jab, but Crawford stands his ground and shoots the left hand. What does Spence do? He crouches. I guess he slightly rolled that, but still, 
that should hit him Loki to the back of the head he's not a happy camper right now Spencer's surprised he landed it's set up with that shit that finished Hank Lundy that combination downward trajectory spearing you know that's scary that makes people jump on their head go into acrobatics like you don't fall regular on that shit go into a spasm after trying to jump in an imaginary pool like look at fucking Spencer's eyes man what happened there his eyes didn't look right going in but what the hell happened with his eyes man it's a jab huh it's like he's getting poked or something man levering by Crawford those levers he puts out there to kind of either neutralize Spence on the inside or set up like avenues for punches and he doesn't do it necessarily like in a posing type of way you know what I mean he just takes the opportunities like subtly see the way he just like showed him a little roll and put that stiff jab on him now he's gauging put the hand on his shoulder then put a the little jab out there Ugh, it's all like thought out. See the feints, man. Ooh. Put a feint on him, you know what I mean? Shook his nervous system. These little jabs, see, again, the way he's like double jabbing him. Spence has no defense for that shit. That wasn't good, you know, the way Spence. Look at his legs. The way they straightened. I feel like he, he got concussed, man, in the, the first knockdown and never recovered. Because when you watch him getting up from the knockdown, going back to his corner, like he's good at faking, I guess. And he has a lot of heart, you know, he has grit. And he'll try. Like Spence knows the shit is coming. Can't get away from it though. Look at these exaggerated steps by Spence, man. Nothing is subtle. Derek James didn't didn't really help in the corner, I believe. They seem like two damaged individuals, you know, trying to have a conversation. Huh? What'd you say? Huh? No, I'm telling what? Huh? A lot of this. That wasn't good. That wasn't good. This doctor just had this dude like tripping over him. Look at Spence. That wasn't him tripping over the foot of the doctor. He wasn't even near him. A neurological exam would probably tell you that Spence has a lot of trouble right now. And he's not right. I seen that shit. Like a death in the ring analysis. Our fighter like from round to round is like regressing. The first sign of trouble came at the start of the second round. Munson staggers slightly as he stands up in his corner and steps to the middle of the ring. Experts call this a gait disturbance, something ringside doctors, referees, and others are trained to look for as evidence of a changing condition. He looks fatigued coming out already. Um, um, so he takes a jab, he takes a leg kick. Okay, and then there's, I guess, a timeout for going kick right there. You see, the the ref breaks it from the from what I presume was he thought was a going kick, and then he turns away. The ref turns away, but the African American kid stumbles. He he doesn't have his feet under him at that point. That's not exhaustion. That's lack of coordination. See, he he takes a takes a weird step there. That's the first thing that I would notice where I would be watching really carefully. His feet cross, putting him in a vulnerable position. And he, and he staggers, and his arms go down. And right then and there, you know, I'm, I'm doing I'm doing this as a ringside position for over 20 years. 
and we watch the fights very closely. One of the first things you look for is any kind of gate disturbance. And when you see a gate disturbance or you see a fighter, you know, with some balance issue, you right away kind of get on the edge of your seat because you're kind of wondering at that point, you know, was there a shot? Was there something else that happened? Was there something you didn't see? You really err on the side of caution for an amateur. You know, and especially a first fight guy, I'm telling my referees, hey, this is the guy's first fight. I'd rather they get upset with my referee and then I'll take the heat off the referee and say that the commission ordered it. regard man it's always scary fighters like that definitely should get pulled like that's what they tell a fighter to go to one side and then to the other walk a straight line essentially like he just seen spans man he just showed you what he's gonna do in 20 years is he gonna be one of those can walk a straight line can't talk he's gonna fall if you're gonna tell him to shadow box eventually he's gonna fall it's like saying does the good outweigh the bad you know what i mean What do the good parts of boxing and the excitement of boxing and the people you meet, the thrill of being a fighter, the thrill of knowing you are a fighter, would that outweigh the consequences? I don't know. It all depends on the individual. I think it's harder for the family members than it is for Denny and Phil because in their world, they're okay. In their world, you know, nobody is hurting. Nobody, you know, they, they don't know what peace is really missing. And sometimes it takes him a while, but today I went in and and he kissed me, so he knew it was me. And Philip's like that too, in response to his wife. I can remember a few years ago when I first started here, um, whenever he would get upset, he couldn't remember her name, but he would know that, you know, the, the, that lady. He would say to that, that lady. Take care. You know, right. you know, see it. It was a very painful reunion for me. On the other hand, I see that he's, he, He's still the underlying Tony he always was. Remarkably happy, very upbeat. Uh, I mean, he is truly uh, the embodiment of forgiveness. Sometimes I just sit and marvel at him to be able to go through the day. So parts of him are still the old Tony if you look. Anybody who wants to deny the brutality of the sport and the damage that, is, that it does to a brain is living in fantasy land. I, either they're blind or they want to be blind to the effects of it. It's not an isolated case. It is not an isolated case. It's one of many. It's hard to think back and, you know, so what he is now and what he was back then, it's such a big, huge difference. I don't want to put no grief on anybody. The grief of death alone in the family is enough, but to go through punishment and then death is just too much. We're all that they have between now and the end. And um, I just think that they all deserve a little bit more respect than they're getting. The doctors told me about how it is. They just, uh, 
lose a little bit all the time, and he's not aware of it. In other words, he's living over there, but really he's dead. Phil Moyer on the black trunks. The 23-year-old Moyer is a substitute for his brother Denny, who came down with an ear infection earlier this week. He's in the midst of a comeback campaign and has won both his bouts this year. One minute to go in round 10. The finish should be furious. The large crowd is applauding. to let him go four or five more rounds and there's a reason why he got in there maybe there were concerns already for friends bands like i remember like this guy being a big welterweight that we didn't have any concerns for he's damaged goods at this point i understand like he got dropped but it's not like he took a vicious beating you know he got tagged a couple of times and, and the doctor's already in there maybe they saw what i just saw after the first round kind of showing signs of having balance issues and this is a clear sign this is why i'm making this video just re-watching this fight right and i see this dude like have a disappointed reaction because the ref allowed the timekeeper the round to start and then call time so essentially both fighters thought um, they were going to start fighting spence kind of took it as a bad omen you know for the doctor to come in and maybe had hoped that he would uh, just be observing from outside but Dude is in there. You can't beat this time already when the doc is checking on me. Also for cloud reasons, man. You know, the public profile of a lot of athletes has increased so much, man, that every reaction. We've lost a lot of genuine reactions in sports. Are determined, planned almost. They're always aware that they could lose cloud and I'm sure it was always that to a certain extent, but come on, we're in trouble, bro. Like you don't think uh, LeBron James thought about how he'd react if um, he'd win a championship for Cleveland or Floyd Mayweather when he like beat Ricky Hatton that he didn't play this out man or you think this is his personality. He got a lot of phonies man that are pretty good athletes and legends. Yeah but fucking Spence man that was a genuine reaction he was fucking he's like damn making me look dumb in front of yellow Beezy or something anyway that misstep man that's kind of concerning bro like he can't turn around and walk back to his corner without almost like tripping over himself like that's not a good sign bro 33 that's uh prime years still you know especially in this time everybody talking about scientific progress everything gets better with time but Sugar Ray Robinson, man, he's still whooping ass at 36 and shit. Robert, still whooping ass at 36. I guess there are exceptions, right? Fuck time or futuristic training methods, man. They're just legends. That's that. Outliers. Spence is like us. The protagonists, those that wish boxing to continue, have to be honest and say, look, boxing is dangerous. But then we have to try and decide how dangerous. The only thing I can ever remember being said, yeah, it makes you punchy. Nobody said, well, wait a second, what does punchy mean? These are not actors you're going to see. They're real fighters who are once top names in the ring. Uh, what's your name? My name is Joey Grepp. Wait, how old are you? I'm 57 years old. Uh, how many fights have you had, Joey? I had 243 fights. Did you ever fight any champions? I fought so many, I forgot who I fought. Brain damage in boxing can be, again, quite clearly divided into two types. Acute brain damage, chronic brain damage. Acute brain damage is in nearly all cases due to a thing called a subdural hemorrhage. If you start bleeding in that gap between your brain and your skull, what happens then, there's a sudden catastrophic pressure change and boom, it all falls apart. Benny went down, not from any one punch, but from an accumulation of punches. Dr. Schiff says, let him alone, he'll probably be all right. No cause for excitement. The chronic brain damage is just the cumulative effect of blows that are going to hit you. They're not going to knock you out. You keep boxing, you walk into another and another 
and changes occur within the microscopic structures of the brain. Damaging the front part of your brain will damage your ability to make good decisions. And they won't recognize that they're troubled. Richard Hall should not be taking these shots. Thank God. I was close to getting the shot at the middleweight title. And as long as I was winning, I didn't pay no attention to the effects that I had or the, the wounds or whatever you want to call it. After 1981, I mean, I just start, my eyes just start going bad. I got thumbed in the right eye and I got another one in the left eye. And I went and I saw Dr. Chinowit in Portland, Oregon. And I went into his room, the lights were so bright, I couldn't see nothing. He looked at me and he estimated that I was blind 18 months. I was boxing blind for 18 months. I didn't know it. Why? I was winning. Winner never sees no flaw. Vasily Jarov was my opponent uh, March 13, 2004. I dominated the whole fight till 12 seconds left in the ninth round. Where I was hit with a shot behind the head. And uh, from then on, the, the story's kind of foggy. And there goes Macy on a right hand across the top. And Macy yeah. badly hurt now as Jarov goes to the body. That's the Jarov duck and trade. After the fight, I had some um, headaches, you know, for a couple of days. So we went to our local doctor and got some MRIs, and they found uh, the injury, they found the problem. I went to see uh, the finest neuro neurosurgeon in the world with Joe, and he laid it right on the line. You're going to have to be here in Boston for several days, Mr. Macy. And I said, we'll stay a month. I'm his father. I got to know these things. I got to know if he's okay or not. I didn't seek out Joe Macy. He, he sought out me. He came to me for an opinion. Technically, Joe had what we call a subdural hematoma. And that's a type of brain hemorrhage where the very thin, fragile blood vessels on the surface of the brain, as the brain twists around inside the skull, these get stretched and twisted and they can rip. And when they rip, they don't spurt blood, they ooze. He's not more susceptible to have a subdural hematoma because the vein that broke is gone and therefore can't cause him more trouble in the future. The Nevada Commission is the only commission in the world that has this one-line rule that says you cannot fight if you've ever had a history of a subdural hematoma. We have the neuro neurosurgeons with the credentials and the family and the fighter saying we're okay. That should be enough. I think the tests that we're taking, first of all, are not adequate. There's got to be some different type test. I mean, you can see a boxer who can pass every test, and you can see him stumbling in the ring, has no coordination, but still he passes the test. I went to UCLA Medical Center and got on all the machines, the kidney, brain, thyroid, urine, blood, all kind of tests, three days, okay. Then I went to Mayo Clinic, the boss of all clinics, Mayo, stayed two days, A1. Do I sound like I have brain damage? I'm not making excuses. I think it helped me because I didn't went around. I was too weak. I didn't throw it people. This is why the woman is retired. Legally, in a court of law, you know, lawyers, judge wants to use hard data. And if someone's passed their test, they want to say, well, you put them through all these tests, then they should be able to fight. Give them their license. Well, if you, if you want to let fighters fight that shouldn't be in the ring any longer, then just use tests as your only criteria. Ali's very last fight, and it was one day after training that Angelo asked me, confidentially says, Emmanuel, I feel that Ali should quit. His reflexes have slowed down. What do you think? And I agreed with him. He wasn't there. He was in no, no, no shape. People said, why don't you tell him to retire? Well, I don't ever play God with fighters. I told Muhammad, you do what you want to do with your life, son. That's what he should do. It's his life. I got more sense than anybody. I can, who can handle you like I'm handling you now? Brain damage. He had Parkinson. He had Parkinson before he stopped fighting. But the Parkinson affects his, uh, his movement. And the ex-champ has to hold on. Ali in his own corner, being battered. 
Ali looks like he's getting very tired. It looked to us at ringside that, you know, you were slow, you were telegraphing your punches, the eyes could see it, but the physical ability just couldn't get it there. It wasn't from boxing. It's not a disease affiliated with boxing. If a doctor can tell me that, I'll say amen. Dementia pugilistica comprises several different things, but you don't have to have all the parts. One of the things are problems that lead to Parkinsonian-like symptoms. It's not Parkinson's disease, but it's Parkinson's symptoms. This particular part is most dramatic in what is called bradykinesia, which means slowness of initiating a movement. Best example of this is, of course, Muhammad Ali. It's tough to foresee a tragedy. I hope we could foresee it and prevent it because who wants a guy to get hurt? Does that mean that he can't be hurt in the ring? Absolutely not. Any boxer can be. The question is, are they at greater risk? I don't want to get into statistical arguments of if, but some maybes, it could be this, it could be that. The bottom line, it bled once, it could bleed again. If it bleeds again, it may be a catastrophic bleed that makes Joe dead. It was kind of a freak incident that had happened. I don't think his anatomy is any different than the rest of ours to make him more susceptible to that form of injury. It's very probable that the very small amount of bleeding that Joe had happens in fighters more often than we're aware of. And it is true that a study done some years ago of boxers that had dementia pugilistica, the majority of them had evidence of intracranial bleeding. He had a brain bleed. That should be the end of your career. He's a smart guy. He's a very good looking guy. So I really don't understand why he would even continue to fight. How can you stop an athlete from, or anybody, from earning his living? You can't tell the kids stop. It's like cutting off uh, circulation, like stopping living. It can't be the what if, it's what is, is that I'm healthy now. I don't want to risk my life, not for anything. But it has to be handled case by case. I think boxing is my right. If you can listen to the physicians at the American Association of Ringside Physicians, they will tell you the highest mortality rates are fighters whose fathers are in the corner. The Gillette Cavalcade of Sports is on. Some of them are scary. You never know if you're going to wake up. The closest I got to thinking that I had a major tragedy was the uh, second Johansson Patterson fight at the Polo Grounds. At 151 of the fifth round, Patterson threw a sensational left hook probably most vicious left hook ever in the ring. His leg was quivering. He was on his back. He must have been on his back maybe for about 10 or 11 minutes. Maybe more, I don't know. The greatest amount of damage that occurs to boxers is when they're in that defenseless state. The acceleration forces which can be transmitted to the head are markedly accelerated when the neck is limp. The actual damage caused by the knockout, it's that swiveling motion of the, the cortex and the brain stem. The heavy hemispheres of the brain and the brain stem for microseconds are kind of going in different directions and some of those nerves get stretched, some of them get torn. So those are probably the punches that can create uh, the central hematomas that we see. He's just more like us. That's all. That's okay. You know, that actually should um, make us want to care for him more. You know, look out for him when he doesn't have anybody to look out for him. Because Derek James needs someone to look out for him. Derek James should have stopped the fight earlier. What we were watching was some indecisive ass shit, and could have actually. You know, shortened his career, spends his career, shortened his life. That's, you know, that's the reality of the shit, man. One, and we had some comments concerning that. Let's go to the fight, Doctor. Tony, with everything that happened, I was very concerned. He looked so bad in that first round. I thought you should have stopped it, and I said it rather hard. 
uh, to the audience. I'd like to hear your view of it. Why didn't you stop it? Well, it's very simple. I talked to the man and he answered me my questions very correctly and he was very awake, so I let him continue. I gave him another chance. Of course, the second time, he didn't answer you correctly and you stopped it. The second time, he didn't know where he was. I talked to him and he turned his eyes on me and his eyes were back, his eyes glassy and his legs rubbery. That's what I stopped the fight. Once again, proving that the men in the ring know better than anyone and so we go back to Dick Enberg. All right, thank you, doctor. So Even later, people said, yeah, it's confirmed. He, uh, he does have a broken jaw and he may never fight again because of that. No. Well, I could see where people would feel that uh, his jaw was broken. The rumor started by just simply looking at him. One side of his jaw was twice the other side. Ruling out mumps rather immediately, you could come up with a diagnosis <laughs> yeah. that he had a broken jaw. Uh, getting down to the confirming it, that, as you know, in, uh, in your business or my business, or in the boxing business, rumors fly and they're confirmed by all sorts of people. So fortunately, he had no serious injury. And the injury that he has is so minor that it probably will disappear in another five or six days. That's definite. That's absolutely I wonder possible. if people are anxious in some sense for fighter to be hurt, because the word just spread. People said, I heard it, I got it direct from the doctor. I think it heightens the drama of, the, uh, yeah. of a naturally dramatic contest. It's probably nothing more dramatic than a heavyweight uh, championship fight between two equally matched fighters. I, I don't see that um, the public would want to uh, uh, diminish it by uh, not spreading these gory rumors. Mm -hmm. So I also heard that Joe Frazier's jaw was broken. And, and by like the end of the evening, I heard Count Basie and Buddy Rich's jaw was broken. <laughs> Everybody's jaw was broken. Yeah. They got the names wrong, but they had... Well, Same what do you, plot. how do you watch a fight? Do you, or, Nervously. I'll bet you do, yeah. Anxiously. What do you I usually have some place to go after the fight, and I'm always praying that my fighter doesn't get hurt so mm -hmm. I can go. Unfortunately, this blew the whole thing yesterday, and we spent the whole night in the hospital back and forth. W would it have been good for him to stay in the hospital? Or? No, uh, it, it, it would be a good medical practice, but for the same reason that you pointed out a moment ago, the confirming of rumors and the starting of rumors, it's sort of disastrous to put a fighter in the hospital overnight. All of a sudden, uh, uh, vicious connotations begin, and uh, people say, well, Joe Frazier put this guy in the hospital for a day, and uh, Although it's great for the publicity flex to, to uh, start to churn up a rematch, it's, uh, not, it's not good for the fighter, and I don't think that was a true reflection of what happened to him. Does Muhammad feel that he lost? I mean, why did you decide to do that at that time? Well, that was easy. If you start with a guy, you should finish with a guy. No. Did you not think he was I'm going a, on too long? Well, no, I'm a firm believer. And I'm a firm believer not playing God with an individual. Muhammad did what he wanted to do. Let's face it, it starts with Muhammad, because nobody made Muhammad get into the ring against Larry Holmes. But he had a manager who benefited handsomely from that fight, and the manager should have told him, no, this is not a fight that should be allowed to happen. These people that say that Ali should have stopped, I say they are right, but I didn't have that authority over Ali that they thought. Ali, has, Ali was always his own man. And if I didn't do it, he would have did it himself or got somebody else to do it. Herbert, you know, he played, the, he, he played the game of sounding like he wanted equipment while making, I mean, he, he was, that was his only way to make a living. And he was really, those guys really dug into him deep. You know, Don King took a nick, but these guys made it a career. But I think so, when somebody sees Ali fought like for $6 million, Jeff, he fought for $6 million. And you got $2 million of that $6 million. That was too much for you to get for. Ali got four and you had to fight. You got $2 million for one fight, one night. I said, that's according to the contract. We agreed and that was it. And I, I think people say, yeah, it was too much money for you guys. His family would definitely say it. All of his around, all the people around there would say it. But that was our agreement. Like he said, here, I'm going to fight Larry Holmes. I'm getting $8 million to fight Larry Holmes. He said, a man 60 years old who's dying in his bed would get out and fight Larry Holmes for $8 million. I didn't go out there to try to be a mercenary and kill him. I went out there to fight him to win it. Not to hurt him, but just to win the fight. And I think I gave him a lot of credit from that fight uh, after that. The Nevada State Athletic Commission had a copy prior to the fight of Ali's medical records in the Mayo Clinic. Those medical records showed that when Ali tried to touch his finger to the tip of his nose, he missed the target.
lives here. This dude in the fourth round is making pirouettes. Like, what the fuck is that? Explain to me what this move is, man. Please, please explain to me. Why is Spence looking like this? So he's ready. He's ready to go. Rev is in the time. Look at Spence. Grof is ready for the shit. Oh, look at Spence, even like the way he's walking. He's not walking normal, man. Did you see that? He wants to fall. He wants to fall, man. Like, Crawford is seeing this shit, bro. How? Oh my god, bro. Let me put it to 05. His right leg isn't working the way he wants it to. See this shit? See this shit? What is that? He almost collapsed right there. It is kind of sad, man. That he was allowed to keep going. <laughs> That's the Ferdi Pacheco types, you know what I mean? They get paid to <laughs> let the fights go on. Nobody mentioned that shit, man. This dude is like goofing off with his balance. was nothing like I said bro these dudes get paid to let fights go you ready to go he's asking me that's so odd man goodness that walk to that neutral corner even His goofy feet, man. His feet are goofy. Right now. As if he was wearing Mike Tyson's shoes from the from the way in. You see that? How oh, the ref just took him off a square like that, bro? That's not normal, man. He has no. And he didn't have it in the first round. To be completely honest, there's a clinch in the first round and Crawford just shrugs him off, man. I understand he hit him before that. Maybe Spence just went for the clinch trying to smother. And I've seen Crawford do that in the Jeff Horn fight, in the Gamboa fight, in a bunch of fights, you know what I mean? He likes to show like that he's the stronger, that he will strong arm you in the clinch, turn you, you know? Then he winks to his, to his family, sticks his tongue out, you know what I mean? That type of shit. It's amateur shit, you know what I mean? It's fundamentals, man. He's been doing that turning people since the amateur. They take pleasure. Like, these are superior boxers. They like to slap you on the ass, turn you. These are mind games. Established, traditional. Not the type of fighter you want to be in there with if you're already, like, having balance issues and your footing is obviously not there, you know what I mean? The moment you square up, you it's the Tyson thing, right? Eddie Mustafa Muhammad talked about it. How he sparred Mike Tyson, went up to the Catskills and he understood that if you box him, he will square up in front of you, you know what I mean? So you just gotta push him, like kind of be physical with Mike, you know what I mean? And then put that jab in his face and run combinations on him and shit like that. And muscle him in the clinch because he likes to clinch, but he's not necessarily like, he's resting essentially, you know what I mean? And I feel like Crawford knew that Spence went into smother and rest, not rest because he's not in condition, Rest to kind of recompose, like trying to think for a second. Look at that, bro. After he lands his jab to the body, look what happens. Look at his back foot. That's not normal. That's not normal. What is that? Comes from the front foot to the back foot like... Ugh, he wants to fall. 
Ugh. You've seen the Dazen move, man. Spence isn't chinny. He's actually still super strong. That's the crazy part. It's his balance. Ooh, he didn't know where to go. Didn't know where his corner was. See that? That's crazy. I bet Crawford knows that too. He's see Crawford picked up on it. I remember Bernard Hopkins fighting Jermaine Taylor in the second fight and he kept doing that and Freddie Roach was his trainer for that fight and he talked about it after he asked Bernard to retire after that fight he thought that was a sign of a fighter like losing his faculties you know huh. I would love to hear what he's saying Lying to him. His nose is busted. The jab. That's where all the blood is coming from. That's why his eyes looked like they did at the end. You know, he was probably blowing his nose and shit. Probably couldn't breathe through his nose. That didn't help. You know what I mean? But that's essentially like accumulation. Like he came in outmatched. That's bad now. Because now he's like posting on his on his head, man, pushing him down. Because that's his natural inclination anyway to crouch. And you see that back foot of Spence, man. He's giving. He's so composed. Good left hand, but he gets immediately checked, bro. He's getting led too, like in, into counter punches, man. And he's leaning, like he needs to lean on him to to have that balance. You know what I mean? To not like over overshoot. Wow, look at him, man. Masochistic, you know. <laughs> the way he's like grinning. All bloodied up. Spence is trying here. But he's also fighting. <laughs> that, that, like these, these are jabs, guys. I mean, he's catching him perfect too. Look at him, he almost sat down. That tells you he's in shape, actually, that he's not falling. That's Richard Pryor, man. He's in too good a shape. The legs won't fall. He's still maneuvering. Like Crawford is aware. He's not just shelling up. He's thinking. Oh, he just wants to check him, bro, with that right hook. Yeah, you want to open up, man? I'm going to bite my time. See, Crawford looking to the crowd and shit in the clinches. That's, that tells you a lot, bro. About awareness. Where he is in the fight. Look at him, man. Preoccupied with someone in the crowd. Complete control. Uf, 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 see, that was a rush for all the talk about Sean Porter, man. Arrow Spence, man. You gotta also like eat your words in that regard. He's getting tagged here. He's on a on a on a string as far as the job is concerned, man. Right hand jab, man. It's a southpaw equation. Like he doesn't do well with southpaws. I feel like it was Emmanuel Latte, the guy that tagged him early in his career. You know, that was a southpaw, right hook. But for all the talking about Sean Porter, man, huh? that style and uh, how Sean Porter isn't able to box. If Sean Porter man had the physical dimensions of a uh, Errol Spence, man, Terence Crawford might not have beaten him. <laughs> then again, probably his size also plays at times into like the effectiveness of his spurts and rushes. You know what I mean? But uh, Sean Porter's footwork is underrated. That was kind of downward trajectory. And also the way he's like short distance able to, that would have murdered Spence. The way Spence is rushing in there to 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 get a break, like he <laughs> to get his licks back. You know what I mean? That's very Sean Porter esque, to be honest with you. In in the smothering of his own shots. Huh. See, Spence is so dazed he wouldn't have had the awareness of a but 
to like get to get his corner to wipe something like he was just like blinkingly walked out there <laughs> it's the right hook goodness gracious goodness gracious look at the balance the way he's like yeah he's lunging but he's keeping his balance Crawford his power is generated at the end of his shot still you think he's lunging or he's like square or whatever like a lot of people talk about the Crawford style how they don't like it you know because they're conditioned to like that cookie cutter pad work style they're looking for a certain for a certain type of shit hash, hash, hash. type of shit you know you seen that bro you seen that a little right hook counter just like off it's almost like his feet are together he just can't man that's just but let's look at spence how did he approach that stepping in there his legs are done look at his legs wobbly jittery he's having trouble uh, uh, that doesn't look coordinated guys that looks like a stroke victim man look the way he's walking into that his legs are all jittery and fucked bro that shouldn't have put him down like that man that's a double right hook that second one is what has him wobbling getting up like that see it's again downward trajectory guys like he's already falling and gets clipped like completely unprotected you know on top of the head again see that, that's a discouraged fighter right there goodness the fact that he was even able to walk that man his see the way he's like man he's getting clipped also like consistently with hard hooks you know sharp hooks you see he's getting tagged to the same spot over and over man to the right side of his face man he's tough though he's super tough i feel like we've seen it now oh man uh, okay yeah to to end this we've seen him like with that awkward reset not good all right then take care